the question that I get most from my colleagues at Berkeley is, how did you get selected? <laughs> uh, <laughs> and I just, uh, but basically um, what I want to do is to try to talk about a question that um, most audiences um, that I've talked to uh, over the course of the several years uh, that I've talked about the book since this publication, um, you know, it's, it's, it, it, to me it's at the core of the book, and that is what is historically important about the Black Panther Party? Why should we care? Um, what continues to resonate um, with, um, should and does continue to resonate with us? And um, there are several things that I'd like to emphasize, and I would just want to say that we are going to keep our remarks uh, brief so that we can engage in conversation, but I just wanted to lay out several kinds of points. Um, first off, um, for us, as we were trying to pull this together and thinking about the enduring uh, historical significance of the party, um, the first thing I'd like to, to highlight is politics, the centrality of a serious, radical, revolutionary politics, why it's important, what it's about. Um, and if you cannot um, take politics seriously and you don't see politics as a serious undertaking, then I think you're really going to have some problems with the party, because I think the party took politics in a kind of committed, dedicated, revolutionary way that um, made it very, very important then and makes it important today. And so thinking about that politics, I just want to say several things. One is um, the ways in which uh, you have to contest power, uh, especially power at the top. It's not going to give you anything. As Frederick Douglass said, if you want something, you have to fight for it. It's not going to dribble down. The crumbs are not going to feed you. Um, what you want, you have to fight, you have to embody, and you have to be vigilant in your struggle. The other kind of thing about political power that I would emphasize in terms of thinking about the party uh, is not just it, its sort of enduring sort of significance as part of a, a, a history of resistance, a, a history of political activism rooted in the African-American struggle, but ultimately speaking uh, to the broader American project, a broader hum humanist project, a broader global project, uh, uh, seeking democracy, freedom, equality, all those things. But there's a specific historical moment in the transition in the broader black freedom struggle uh, that the party really encapsulates. And for us, we were trying to get inside of. And that's how and why and what consequences the party comes to represent, in a lot of ways, uh, the quintessential black power uh, expression and how and why as uh, black power takes root in the uh, late 60s and uh, you know, develops in the late 60s and, and into the 70s, the Black uh, Panther Party uh, comes to embody that in a way that seizes the global imagination. It's not just sort of a local uh, phenomenon. It's not just a national phenomenon, but it's a global phenomenon. And the politics that drove that uh, is very important for us to think about and understand. And that's one of the things that Josh and I wanted to, to get into. Another kind of issue in terms of thinking about power and in terms of thinking about politics is to understand that there are varieties of black activism. There are varieties of black politics and that the party built upon some of those, uh, innovated in some of those traditions, uh, drew from other traditions. And so what you really get is an extraordinary creation uh, by Huey uh, Newton and Bobby Seale, the founders, but others obviously contribute. So it's an open, it's an eclectic, it's um, a very uh, improvisational political project but it's all, always rooted in some core principles, and Josh will talk a lot more about some of those, but I'd just like to say something about, at the core, 
one of the issues for us in terms of thinking about the politics was to think about how those politics were anti-imperial. Um, this is one of the reasons uh, not only it resonated in the late 60s, early 70s, uh, across not only uh, black America, but uh, left progressive uh, uh, fronts, uh, other struggles among communities of color, other struggles uh, among other sort of oppressed groups. Um, and so thinking about how you resist American empire at home and abroad, not only in terms of a third world kind of sensibility, but also understanding uh, peoples of color as internal colonies, how do they uh, sort of define themselves, how do they uh, uh, determine their own existence. So some of the most compelling uh, sort of ways in which we thought this politics expressed itself were both global, connecting up with uh, anti-imperial, anti-colonial struggles around the globe, but also sort of how that uh, consciousness uh, expressed itself. Um, another expression of that was sort of the anti-war uh, sort of uh, sensibility and commitment, which was at the core of the party's uh, um, uh, work, uh, and also sort of the anti-draft work, and obviously this made uh, coalition work very possible and very fruitful. I want to say two more things. One is uh, a problem as a historian that I confront uh, daily in my teaching, and that is trying to get students to understand the specificity, uh, the particularity of a particular moment in time, and how and why you understand why people do what they do at that time under those circumstances, and how you can't just read back who I am, what I think, and then that's adequate to understand what people did 40 or 50 years ago. To understand what people did 40 or 50 years ago, you literally have to put yourself in their position. You have to empathize. You have to sympathize. And I think sort of getting students to think historically, what the, the big point for Josh and I was that uh, the late 60s and early 70s, um, radical change, revolutionary change, for a lot of people seemed possible. And for some people, it seemed imminent. For some, it appeared to be right around the corner. So if that is the world you inhabit, then that particular understanding shapes and drives your politics. And I think the Black Panther Party personified that. It seemed possible. It seemed doable. The fact that it didn't quite turn out the way that most people uh, in the party wanted it to um, has a lot to do with sort of the, the historical circumstances, all the things that happened. But that kind of commitment, that kind of understanding, how you seize a moment, how you seize not only the local, national, and global imagination is something that I think the party uh, you know, really uh, was quite extraordinary at, and that's something that I think I'd like to talk about. Um, I always get lots of questions that go something like this. What was the role of women in the party? Um, even though it started initially as primarily a male formation, at its height, there would have been no party without women, obviously. Um, the Black Panther Party, especially if you saw that exhibit over in Oakland, I mean, it was like one of the strengths of the exhibit was I thought it sort of gave you a strong and insightful understanding of who the members were, what they did, who the local people were that made the party. Um, and to me, uh, and for Josh as well, um, the grassroots activists, the young black folk who joined the party and gave their lives to the party is what the party was about. And so at its core, um, these were people who were committed to a kind of radical politics. And so when I get the question about gender and sexuality, um, this was a, a concern that roiled the nation. You know, uh, there was a women's movement going on. There was a whole feminist cr critique emerging. There was a womanist critique, em critique emerging. There was third world women's feminism. And a lot of the, the women and men in the party were obviously part of that yeasty, uh, experience. 
And so on the ground, people struggle with this. And this is what really comes through. We try to integrate sort of the struggle around those kinds of issues throughout our book. But the organization was often under siege. That siege mentality drew members together and it tended to override differences. But day to day, ordinary people were struggling just like uh, other people with issues of changing gender and sexual roles. But, you know, I, the, the upshot of it is that women, it, it, every social movement that I know about, every social organization that I know about, uh, women, uh, uh, if, you, if you really want to know who's doing the work, you go out there and you see who's on the line. And, and women dominate in a lot of those, those. They may not be the out front leadership, but they clearly, there is no movement without women, clearly. The final thing that I want to say something about is one of the things that I most admire about the party, and I think it has some particular relevance, and especially for the kind of um, points that Josh wants to make, is this notion of um, action versus rhetoric. Uh, one of the things that I find most compelling and most impressive about the party was that they not only talked the talk, but they walked the walk. And what I find so often is that even back then, um, there's a lot of people with a lot of good rhetoric. You know, you know they can throw down. You know, you, oh, oh, oh. But when push comes to shove, they're over in the corner. You know, they ain't gonna do nothing. Um, and the party was totally committed to action. Uh, totally committed to understanding that if we're going to get a people to move in a radical, a revolutionary direction, we have to work with them. We have to facilitate that change. And we have to be the agents of that change that can work with our people to bring that about. And to me, that's an extraordinary kind of commitment that's often ill understood. You work where you are, serving the people in ways that make sense and help them, and then you can sort of help them to think about how you expand your political horizon, how you expand your political action. And that kind of work, I think, is still relevant today. And I know uh, my colleague uh, and, and extraordinary friend Joshua Bloom, being a sociologist and being someone who's very much committed to sort of uh, radical social transformation, has a lot to say about where we go from here and sort of what the Panther Party uh, tells us about today. So I want to turn the uh, podium over to Josh. Good afternoon. Um, so thank you, Waldo, for those inspiring um, comments. I want to thank also um, Naomi and the entire library staff um, for having this event, um, David D for facilitating the conversation. Um, are there any Black Panthers uh, here in the audience? Um, thank you for coming. Um, I want to thank all the Black Panthers um, who you know, risked their lives and those who gave their lives for our freedom. Um, and I want to um, also thank all of you who came here today to have a conversation about um, this history. Um, so history does not provide easy answers. I wish it did. Um, racism has been around a long time, and it keeps changing forms. Um, so you know, many people perhaps are coming here today to think about this current historic moment we're in. How do you resist racism today? How do you resist the rise of a xenophobic authoritarianism? Um, and um, unfortunately, old forms of resistance don't necessarily work well in new circumstances and new conditions. Um, I think that, um, and many of you know this, better than I do, but that the, the, the solutions um, are in the creativity, love, and intelligence that's within all of us. Um, so what, what, what can the history of the Black Panther Party bring to this conversation? Um, and I think that the history of the Black Panther Party helps to think about how to ask better questions. 
Um, so I want to talk about um, a few of the, the pieces of that history that I think can help us sharpen some of the questions for today. Um, so to start with, um, there's a moment in the mid-60s where there's really a, a puzzle and a, a transition um, which, which motivated a lot of the research that Waldo and I did um, on this book and trying to understand this history. And there's, the puzzle is that there's, there's this moment in the mid-60s at the end of the civil rights movement, the insurgent civil rights movement, where the civil rights movement has been so effective at dismantling formal segregation and caste subordination. It's been so effective at ending the era of Jim Crow. And yet, there's a sea change in the character of black politics and young people in cities across the country, young black people, turn to a revolutionary politics. They turn away from claims for participation in citizenship rights and they take up the gun. So why does that happen? And, and what is it about this moment um, that leads to these kinds of changes in the, in, the, in the movement? And how does the movement respond to those changes? Um, so 1966 is really a moment of ferment. And we like to think of black power not as an answer, but really as a question. And the question is um, very similar to a question that many of you may come here today asking. And the question is, how do, how do we struggle effectively for liberation? How do we, how do we fight for liberation? Um, in the early 60s, the civil rights movement was very effective at dismantling Jim Crow with civil disobedience against formal caste subordination, um, violation of, of racial segregation, claims for participation in citizenship rights. But the civil rights movement was not able to effectively challenge the poverty, the police brutality, the exclusion from political participation and representation that was prevalent in the cities throughout the country, in the North and the West included. Um, and so those kinds of practices, those civil rights practices, they weren't working. They weren't working at challenging police brutality. And um, lots of people were trying. People tried throughout the 60s. And you read accounts of the Northern Civil Rights Movement um, in the same period. And, and many times, the struggle is like beating, beating your head against a brick wall. So in 1966, this really burst out into a question, a black power question. How do we build political power? Right? You have to think that the cities throughout the country had, where you had large black populations, none of the police were black. It was all white police departments. Municipalities were not hiring black people. Black people were excluded from the political machines. They didn't have roles in the Democratic Party machines. They didn't have roles in the um, Republican Party machines, for that matter, either. So black power is a ferment of people around the country asking a question. Dozens and dozens of organizations in every major city with large black populations. Here in the Bay Area, there were RAM organizations. There was publications like Soul Book. There were people doing, um, trying different kinds of boycotts um, on Auto Row. There were all kinds of efforts to try to figure out how do we build political and economic power. And it's in this moment um, where it's clear that you can't sit in against poverty, you can't sit in against police brutality that the, that the Panthers emerge. Um, and they're very much asking that question. How do we find, right? We can't apply the old forms to the new problems. How do we find the forms that will work for us here and today? Um, so um, I want to just talk, you know, there's, there's obviously more in the book than I can talk about in a few minutes here, but I want to make a, a couple points about how um, the Panthers developed answers to that question. And the first um, is this idea of elaboration, and I want to talk about the story of Denzel Dow. Do, who, who knows about the story of Denzel Dow? Okay, so some people know about Denzel Dow. So um, Huey Newton, um, looked at the urban rebellions, sometimes called riots. He looked at the, the response largely sparked um, in cities across the country by incidents of police brutality and said, that resistance is a source of political power. Those rebellions represent the possibility for political power in a way that we can, what we need to do is we need to channel that. So there was, a, there was an active effort to try to figure out how do we organize that rage into a, into a political power. And, and the first um, practice and the first tactic that the, that the Panthers really developed, which put them on a national stage, was a tactic of policing the police. So what the Panthers said was, we can actually, they studied the law, 
And they said, we can actually tap into that rage by standing up to the police and challenging police brutality. And um, they studied the gun laws, and it was actually legal to carry loaded weapons in the city limits. Um, there were all kinds of specific regulations that they studied in detail about the distance that you had to stand from arrest. And so they went following the police around, looking for instances of police brutality and confronting the police armed. So you can imagine the kind of, um, the kind of uh, uh, tension and, and also um, interest that this built in communities where people had been exposed to um, poverty and a containment policing policy, and all of a sudden here are the Panthers um, saying, hey, you, know, you, can't, you can't treat people like that, and, and confronting the police with, gu with, <laughs> excuse me, with guns. So the Panthers built a small following in Oakland. This went on for um, only really a few months, um, in, in mostly in early 1967, um, right at the end of 1966 as well. They built a small following in Oakland, and what really changed was when a young man, a construction laborer named Denzel Dow, was um, shot and killed in North Richmond, um, just a few miles uh, north of, of Oakland and Berkeley. Um, and um, the police were intransigent. They said, you know, basically, we're, you know, the officer was justified. Now, there was all kinds of evidence. Um, it looked like Denzel Dow had been killed with his hands up. It appeared that he had been shot in the back. Um, there had been a whole history of this particular police officer um, harassing Denzel Dow. So there was a lot of evidence that suggested that something was, was going on here. But the police, and it was really the sheriff's department, um, refused to... Um, refused to even investigate. And so the family of Denzel Dow, um, Ruby Dow and others, they went to the civil rights organizations in the area and they asked for help to address this. But the civil rights organizations didn't have any way to really um, address the situation. So uh, a young man, an activist named Mark Comfort, introduced the Dow family to the Black Panthers. And the Black Panther Party came to, to Richmond and started to organize street rallies. Um, and they start. They went to. There was some confrontations at the school and some um, confrontations at the sheriff's department. And then they organized a series of street rallies. And what happened is, is that you can imagine the Panthers and North Richmond was virtually exclusively black, small community, several thousand people, um, unincorporated, um, and so really fairly little um, political representation, no police representation, a history of brutality. And so people start turning out to these rallies on the street corners. And the Panthers are there on the street corners armed, and people start bringing their own guns. So think about that today. Think about hundreds of black people turning out in this black community, protesting police brutality and the brutality and the injustice of the killing of a black person by police, bringing their own guns, and saying the police you know, you, you don't have any right to, to interfere with what we're doing here, right? So the state, can people imagine that? <laughs> can you imagine that happening today? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, so what, um, what happened is the state changed the law. Right. So they passed, and you have, to, you have to realize this is with the support of the NRA, Signed into law by Ronald Reagan, the state restricted gun rights so that the Panthers could no longer conduct these forms of mobilization. Um, another key innovation that was really a little later was the free breakfast for children programs and the community survival program. So the Panthers very much drew on Malcolm X and the idea and the tradition of really thinking of themselves as, as stewards of the black community, of taking care of the black community. The black community um, has needs, right? And so the, the party from, from the start was not just about self-defense. And, and what really became in 1969, a, a couple years after the founding, what really became the bread and butter daily activities of the party was really about providing for the basic social needs of the party. And um, there were free clinics, there were shoe programs, food distribution, and the, the program that really was the most prevalent um, and the core of the party's um, politics across the country was the Free Breakfast for Children program. Um, and you can imagine that this really was a way that, that people's um, needs were directly being addressed, that the community built support 
um, for the party and that the party also reached out and built alliances, powerful alliances um, uh, with, with interested allies. Now the problem is, and um, so this is um, um, the next point I wanna make, is that um, when you succeed at challenging power from below, what do you think happens? <laughs> you get repressed, right? Power fights back. And so um, let me read to you a quote um, from J. Edgar Hoover who coordinated some of the um, national campaign of repression against the Black Panther Party. Um, this is in response, so he asked for hard-hitting counterintelligence programs. The party by, by 1969 had spread um, to pretty much every significant city in the country, um, more than 70, um, with uh, dozens, in some cases hundreds, and in a few cases thousands of members dedicating their lives to revolutionary struggle through the Black Panther Party. Um, and so J. Edgar Hoover asks for hard-hitting counterintelligence measures that can undermine the, the political salience of the party. And he gets a response from San Francisco agent, actually, saying, um, well, you, you, you don't really understand. A lot of what they're doing is actually feeding kids. So this is what Hoover writes back. One of our primary aims in counterintelligence as it concerns the Black Panther Party, this is Hoover writing to the San Francisco um, director, special agent in charge of the counterintelligence program. One of our primary aims in counterintelligence as it concerns the Black Panther Party is to keep this group isolated from the moderate black and white community which may support it. This is most emphatically pointed out in their Breakfast for Children program where they are actively soliciting and receiving support from uninformed whites and moderate blacks. You state that the Bureau, under the counterintelligence program, should not attack programs of community interest, such as the Black Panther Breakfast for Children. You state that this is because many prominent humanitarians, both white and black, are interested in the program, as well as churches which are actively supporting it. You have obviously missed the point. So from the beginning, but especially in the latter part of 1968 and building powerfully through 1969 and into 1970, the party is faced with a constant barrage of repressive action by the state. Hoover declares um, the party the greatest threat to the internal security of the country. There are constant armed raids on the offices, Panther offices stormed, um, raids with guns um, firing in many cases. Um, and there are a whole range of counterintelligence programs um, aimed at building division between the party um, and its allies as well as within the party. Um, for example, the party um, sends all kinds of inflammatory letters and cartoons to members of the Black Panther Party and to members of the US organization, which is a black nationalist organization in, um, in LA, insinuating assassination plots, et cetera, and trying to foment violence. Um, and when in fact, an, um, several Black Panther Party leaders in Los Angeles are killed by members of the US, perhaps directed, although we don't have smoking guns on that, but certainly encouraged by the, by the counterintelligence program, um, the, count, the FBI celebrates um, these, these victories. Um, similar projects um, in Chicago, similar projects um, in New Haven, really throughout, throughout the country. Um, and the, uh, one, one piece that you may have heard of that I wanna just talk about briefly is um, the assassination of Fred Hampton. Um, Fred Hampton is, uh, he's 21 when he's killed, he's 20 and 21 when he is leading the Black Panther Party in Chicago, Illinois chapter. Um, and um, he's built these tremendous um, support uh, among a whole range of allies, um, including um, a, a group of whites from um, Appalachia who use the Confederate flag um, as their symbol um, called the uh, Young Patriots, a Puerto Rican organization. Um, the big gang, the Blackstone Rangers, and Jeff Fort, there are all kinds of COINTEL pros to try to split them. Um, and he's built community programs on a really vast scale. Um, the Black Panther Party as a whole has. Actually, Yvonne King is um, the person who leads the Breakfast for Children programs there. And um, so what the 
state does is it works directly with the police and just takes a much more direct approach and um, drugs Fred Hampton and raids his house uh, while he's in bed and, and not conscious and shoots him twice in the head. Um, we would not know about this, and this is the last um, point that I want to make. We would not know about the killing of Fred Hampton if it were not for the vast outpouring of support. We might know that he died, but the official story of the, the Chicago police was that this was a warranted raid, that the police knocked on the door, and that the Panthers started shooting, and there was a vast firefight, and Fred Hampton was killed in the crossfire. Um, and the police had all kinds of photo evidence of this, and you know, all, it, it ended up being for you know fake. Um, but um, what um, what happened was there was a vast outpouring of support um, for the party and resistance to the state repression. And so the last the last point, um, this last idea that I want to talk about is is the articulation and resilience. Right? If we know that when you effectively resist the state, the state is going to take action to repress you, then the question becomes, how do you sustain resistance in the face of repression? And what the party did, and again, these politics are not no more than we can sit in against poverty and police brutality, no more can we directly take the models and the actions of the party um, to, to the challenges today in a direct way, but we can learn from the way that they ask the questions and the dynamics of their politics. And so what they did is they engaged in a set of practices where when the state repressed them, it was broadly threatening to many other constituencies beyond the immediate people who were, um, who were, who were part of the party and the constituency of the party. And part of this is the anti-imperialist politics and framework and ideas that the party talked about. So they made, they made common cause um, with a wide range. They said, yes, we are Black Panthers. We are addressing the needs of the black community, but this is part of a global struggle. It's a global struggle against imperialism. Our struggle is part and parcel of the struggle that other people of color are fighting for in, against racism in the US, but it's also part and parcel of the revolutionary struggles abroad. Um, it's part and parcel of the challenge to poverty. And um, what we seek alliances with everyone fighting for their freedom. The Black Panther Party was the first major black political organization to endorse gay rights. Um, while there was a lot of complexity in terms of the dynamics on the ground that Waldo talked about, um, the party in its formal positions was very um, strongly pro-feminist and really talked about the importance of gender liberation. Um, so there was a, a politics, um, both in, in word and in relationship, that um, was able to support the party when it, when it was repressed. And so when you, you have Fred Hampton, just to use the killing of Fred Hampton as an example, so many people turned out from so many different sectors who did not necessarily endorse and support the politics of the party. They were certainly not participating in the politics of the party, but they felt threatened by that repression. So who, who were these folks? And it's specific to the time, right? In part, one of the most important supporting groups in, in Chicago was actually moderate black political organizations. People like Whitney Young from the Urban League, um, who, um, they wouldn't, you know, clearly not supporting the revolutionary claims of the party. They were not supporting the tactics. But you have to remember, police departments are, were all white. There was no municipal hiring, very little municipal hiring of blacks. Black people were excluded from the major political platforms, right? And, and so there was a need for basic redress that had not been addressed in the dismantling of Jim Crow. And so the Black Panther Party was speaking to a, a, a much broader audience. And when folks like Whitney Young saw um, members of the Black Panther Party killed in their bed, um, he saw that as a threat to the, the basic um, trajectory of progress, because if it can happen to the Panthers, then it can happen to us. And similarly, um, a lot of the revolutionary movements and governments abroad saw the struggle of the party here against imperialism as um, part of their struggle. Just a, a few examples. Um, the premier of China, 
um, hosted um, the Black Panther delegations and met with Huey Newton. And there were tens of thousands of Chinese um, rallying in the street in celebration of Huey Newton's visit. Algeria, while it, which was a hub of um, revolutionary movements um, throughout Africa and to some extent internationally, did not have a um, embassy of the US, but created an embassy for the Black Panther Party. So the Black Panther Party had an embassy in Algiers. Um, Cuba um, initiated a project to develop a military training ground for Panthers. So the anti-imperialist politics of the party was situated and framed and the relationships built in such a way that many different constituencies um, saw the party as part and parcel um, of their struggle. Um, the anti-war movement in the US, um, you know, we think about Chicago in 1968, the Democratic Convention and the fights in the streets, but you have to remember that there was also a fight going on inside those halls, right? 80% of Democrats voted to end the war and the Democratic Party pushed through a pro-war platform and a pro-war candidate. So people felt that they couldn't vote and get what they wanted. They were being told, you have to go and die in this war. You're going to be drafted, and you don't have a choice, and you can't vote. So there were a lot of people who may have looked very different than the party and may have had very different politics than the party, but also felt that if the party leaders could be killed in their bed, then they could too. So I'm going to stop there and save some time for a conversation. Thank you. How y'all doing? All right. Waldo didn't have his uh, jacket. I bought mine just in case, but since he didn't have his, I'm not gonna put mine on. <laughs> and no, um, I'm a Raider fan, but I'm not, I'm boycotting the NFL, so there you go. But I'm not throwing away my jacket, though. <laughs> Um, there's a lot to cover, and this book is uh, fascinating. Uh, I teach history a lot of times, and one of the things that I think is important is having uh, detail and contextualizing that detail for the moment in time. Um, we're 50 years past the formation of the Black Panthers. We're talking about 51 years at this point. And I think there's a lot of things that are said casually to the point that they become either cliche or they just become symbols. And uh, what I appreciate about, appreciate about this book is that you all went into great detail and kind of put us in the moment. And so I'll start off with my first question. What stood out to me is the amount of violence that was facing the Panthers. I don't think we have a full appreciation of that. I think we think, well, you know, if they just marched and if they just did it peacefully, um, everything would be okay, but you set the tone and you described this incredible amount of uh, violence where there's really no place to turn. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? You know, the dead ending of the civil rights movement, like civil rights movement hits a wall and you have folks that are trying to make a way out of no way with very little choice but to really and literally pick up a gun. Um, yeah, and, I mean, there's this moment, um, it's not clear what's going to happen with the civil rights movement at first, right? And there's this moment in um, Atlantic City when, um, you know, Freedom Summer has, you know, just completed and the um, Mississippi Freedom um, Democratic Organization is trying to get seated. There's a Dixiecrat, all-white, exclusionary party. And... Um, Johnson plays dirty, right? And um, tricks people to be across the street when things are gonna come to a vote and seats the all white um, Dixiecrat Democratic Party, right? So, so the civil rights movement, it, it 
grinds to a halt, right? There's, there's the capacity to challenge formal caste subordination, but um, how do you take that, that beyond? And I think what you see with the party, it's interesting if you look at some contrast, like actually the US organization that Karenga had was doing some serious organizing in the early days in San Diego and actually faced in those early days some significant repression as well. And then they sort of turned away from that and said, okay, we're, we're not gonna do the serious organizing anymore. We're not gonna stand up and have the sort of confrontation of politics. We're not gonna challenge power. We're gonna turn towards a cultural thing. And then, you know, and I don't know what deals also might've been cut because some people say that there were, but they, they um, were no longer um, facing that kind of repression. The party, the more, the more effective it became, at mobilizing people, the more it tapped into those right. so that anger, the more the more they were repressed. But even beyond just the party itself, there's an appreciation for the violence, understanding the violence that the black community itself was facing. Oh, uh, reading the story about Denzel McDowell, and you know, it's not just him, but it's the constant um, harassing and killing of people. Um, seeing what was going on in Oakland. Uh, the description of some of the police, including the one that uh, Huey was accused of killing. You know, for the first time, you actually hear about his background. This was a beast. You know, when you hear about it, it's like, oh, he killed a cop. And, you know, people have this wave of sympathy until you're like, wait a second, he did this, that, this. You know, it's like, this was an evil cat. And so that, that sort of appreciation, I think, puts it into context. Maybe you can hit on that a little bit. You know, what I'd just like to say is, um, for me, what I think is hard sometimes to grapple with is what I would call state violence. And state violence uh, operates at so many different levels, psychological, emotional, material, institutional. And uh, oppressed people suffer the bulk of the violence meted out by the state. And throughout African American history, whether you're talking about lynching, whether you're talking about the rape of uh, black women in the South. Um, there are all these ways in which um, violence against black bodies has been part of uh, the white suprem supremacist project in this country, and black people have fought back against it. And it strikes me that uh, one of the things that the p party was able to do was to really um, focus on this idea of it's time to get up and stand up. You know, um, somebody has to draw a line in the sand and say, I commit myself that this will go no further, and this is what we are about. And it seems to me that the kind of violence that, you know, was perpetrated against the party is often misrepresented and misunderstood. Virtually all of the violence that, you know, the popular historical mis narratives and misreadings of the party, um, most of that violence was perpetrated against the party. Yeah. The party did, <laughs> they, they, these weren't perfect people. There were some people in there who did some bad things. But most of the bad is being done uh, by the state against the party. And so I think most people don't have a clue. And I think that persists. Yeah. Um, and I think Josh made the point. Anytime you really um, stand up, speak out, and uh, really seek, have, have you disrupt, uh, you offer a very different kind of alternative, and you put the state on its heels, the state responds very aggressively. And this is what you saw with the party. And, um, you know, but thinking in a long term historical frame, the violence, uh, this is very, I mean, what, what, what this country has done and continues to do to indigenous people, very violent. I mean, the theft of the country, the, you know, the murder, the, the genocide of the people. So there's a whole practice of violence and, in, and the role of violence in the creation of this country um, that I think we really have to come to grips with. And I think the party, um, you know, suffered sort of that, you know, practice, um, right. but you know, I, I and you know this, and John knows, um, 
and, and I think somebody said this, one of those guys back then, you know, violence is as American as cherry pie. I mean, it's all over the and place. It's H.R.F. Brown. Yeah, some, yeah. Oh, I mean. You know, and I, you know, it's, it's like, and, and the thing that always gets me is that people are always into physical violence. Yeah. But there's so much emotional and psychological violence perpetrated against working people, against poor people, uh, you know, against oppressed people in general that we, we don't even think. And then people, my students say, well, why are they angry? <laughs> Would you be angry? Uh, to me, anger is a very legitimate response. You know, I, I think, you know, if you aren't angry, you're going to go, you know, you might have some other kinds of issues if you can't sort of like understand that, that kind of response. So, um, you know, as we were working through this stuff, uh, the, the thing that really surprised me was that most of the really bad stuff, because you know, I had read all this stuff, I sort of thought, oh, well, they, but so much of it was fundamentally the state just sort of boot, boom, 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 we're going to destroy you. Right. That's fundamentally what the state said. And, and when you're out to destroy, we see them as enemy number one, you know. Well, this is the other thing that also comes to mind that I don't think is fully appreciated is we see the pictures of Huey, we see the pictures of Bobby, we see the Panthers marching in the documentaries and we forget how young they were. Um, we're talking about the state, we're talking about uh, police, who are older and have these connections to white supremacist organizations because they're recruited. But we're talking about 17-year-olds and 18-year-olds and 19-year-olds and who not only are willing to confront, and this is one of the things I also appreciated about the book, is that you just don't jump into Sacramento, which is what everybody gets to know the Panthers, but you talk about these confrontations that have happened on the streets of Oakland and Richmond where these young folks are armed with uh, the knowledge of the law, who are incredibly disciplined, and who are really going face to face, like clocking the gun and pulling back the rounds in the chamber. And it's like, you step forward, you'll get shot. You know, can we talk a little bit about that? Just that discipline, this willingness to be at such a young age to confront this state power that had terrorized the community. That, I think, is a game changer that we never really look at and, and fully appreciate as to what would draw people to the Panthers versus so many other organizations that were around at that time. Yeah, and Wal Waldo talks about a little bit about this idea of the, the party as doers and not just as thinkers. And some of the ideas, you know, you look at, so you trace the different strands of where the party's ideas came from. Um, you know, the 10-point program is drawn very heavily from Malcolm X. Um, you have the symbol of the party is brought by Stokely Carmichael and comes out of Lowndes County, Alabama. You have much of the sort of anti-imperialist ideas come from the Revolutionary Action Movement. And, you know, the part, you know, Huey and Bobby and a bunch of others had worked with Ram in the Bay Area before, and many of the ideas were the same. And I think what happens is that there's a there's a break, right? That that Huey and Bobby feel like we really need to be mobilizing people. This is this idea of elaboration, right? If we're going to do something like the civil rights movement here, if we're going to really mobilize people, we have to tap into sort of where they're really at. And so they, they saw the anger. They saw the anger at being constantly brutalized. You know, there were all these instances, you know, um, um, Matthew Shepard, I think was his last name, Matthew, and who was killed in um, in, in um, Hunter's Point. Um, there was um, a young girl who was killed at a traffic stop. There were there were a whole series of um, sort of mini rebellions where police beat some people up, right? So there, and and the daily experience. The daily experience of that kind of brutality that you were talking—I mean, this is this is what you know. It's not just about poor people. Right? I mean, I think there's something particular to race and to blackness, right? I mean, Du Bois says whiteness is ownership, and there's a, this this process of, of of dispossession and taking the land and setting the law and and creating blackness as the other and control as whiteness. It's like what Franz Fanon talks about: um, the rule by rifle butt and bayonet. Right? It's not a rule by civil participation. So what the party does, what Bobby and Huey do in that moment is they figure out that 
by standing up to the police that they can actually tap into those, those feelings and that anger and they can channel into a political force. Now, now the, the policing, the patrolling the police is also borrowed. That comes from the Community Alert Patrol in Los Angeles. But what was happening with the Community Alert Patrol is that people would patrol the police and they'd have a tape recorder and a notebook and they'd follow the police and there was a confrontation and the police were brutalizing someone. They'd say, you can't do that. And the police would say, hell, we can't. They'd smash the tape recorder and maybe lock up the person who was confronting them, right? So what Huey and Bobby did is by studying the law, they said, well, we're gonna do just what Community Alert Patrol was gonna do but we're gonna know the law so well and we know that we can carry these, ar these guns. And they would take arrests, right? They, they, in that period, they said, we, we will take an arrest if you arrest us, but we know the law better than you. They knew the law better than the police. And if you arrest us, we're gonna take you to court. But if you try to take my gun or you try to shoot or do something that's against the law, I'm gonna shoot you back. And what's striking is that they did this, they, they, they made these confrontations so precisely, and so there was not a single shot fired in the first six months of the party when they were using this practice. All of the actual shooting confrontations came after the Mulford Act and after this, this practice um, had been outlawed. The other thing that I find um, insightful in the book is the leadership. Um, let me contextualize this. We often hear about black leadership. What does that mean? Um, and we think of a charismatic person who everybody rallies around. But we're talking about the political landscape at that time where people are fighting the war. Um, they're talking about uh, anti-imperialism. But the Panthers are the ones that start to lead. And when we talk about this coalition, what you draw out in the book is these white organizations that come into coalition with the Panthers, first of all, are looking for their leadership and then have to line up with that. So that's one thing if we could talk about that, because I don't think that's fully appreciated. And you talk about one point in the book where it's made very clear that we're gonna break ranks unless you really recognize our leadership versus having this paternalistic uh, type of approach. The other thing is going back to this action scenario, you talk about the anti-war movement is more like a lot of talk until the Panthers and others are coming along and saying, we're gonna be active draft resistors and willing to pay the consequence for that and then everybody falls in line and then leading up to just the leadership and, and the need of the Panthers to have a peace and freedom party, which I have some questions about. But let's just talk about this leadership and this coalition building uh, because it seems like uh, the way it gets described 50 years after the fact is everybody was at the table at the same time and it was a kumbaya festival when really <laughs> no the kumbaya. way you described it in the book <laughs> it was definitely folks who were willing to put their bodies on the line and everybody lining up right afterwards and taking leadership and guidance and and inspiration from this organization that i don't think fully gets credit for that let me let me just say because i'm I, I, i'm going to try to be brief here i want to say a little bit more about the youth angle because one of the things that I try to talk to my students about is sort of youth making change. Um, there's a whole tradition in African-American radical politics of radical youth organizing for change that my students tend not to have a sense of. Hmm. Um, not only do you have the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, which is the cutting edge of radical sort of black youth sort of trying to do something in, in the 60s, but you have organizations which predate them, the Southern Negro Youth Congress in the 30s and 40s. And there's a whole history of radical black youth trying to figure out what can we as young people do. And I think that's an element of what the Panthers are a part of. And I think we need to um, highlight that. We need to highlight youthful audacity, bravery, courage, stepping up, standing out, uh, you know, standing up, standing out too. Uh, but I, I do think that sort of that youth piece and why, how, and with what consequences black youth activism is an important element of the story and how it needs to be highlighted, um, you know, it, it wasn't a bunch of old people sitting around trying to tell the young people what to do. No, it wasn't like that at all. The youth 
decided what they wanted to do. But and it how wasn't just the youth just deciding. You're talking about people who are in one part of the country who get in a car like an Erica yeah. Huggins and drive all the way to the other part to join. You're talking about folks yeah. who are really making um, not just moves, but a full commitment to be totally a part of that that I don't think is fully realized. Yeah. This and wasn't a, a part-time uh, type of endeavor. No, no, go ahead, Jeff. No, I, I want to speak to that because I think it's a really important point and question. And um, it, why does the party emerge at that moment as the point where people really consolidate? I mean, so to just to just give scale, right? At its height, you know, the media has its biases, whatever. But let's use that as one measure. The New York Times during 1970 published an average of three stories a day on the Black Panther Party. That's a higher rate than any civil rights organization during the height of the civil rights movement. Um, we talked a little bit about the international alliances, right? What, what David is saying is absolutely true, right? The party did not go around the country knocking on doors and saying, will you please join us and do this with us, right? People saw the party and they said, that's what we need to do. There were people all over the country Dozens of organizations in many of the larger cities where there were large black populations asking this black power question, how do we build political power? How do we build economic power? And when the party really emerged and developed, people flocked from all over the country, both to the Bay Area, but also to start their own chapters. And the party was inundated. They had to say, no, you cannot join. And they had a whole you know, united front of against fascism was basically a way to let other people also in that they weren't ready to let be, be party chapters. So what was it about the party? You know, what, where, where does that leadership come from? And, I, and this is, you know, again, I don't think the specifics of the answer will answer our questions today, but I think it helps sharpen the question. I think we need to look at practice. I think we need to look at practice, that what the party leaders did, if you look at the, the people who were party leaders, it was an eclectic collection, and none of them was strong at everything, and all had their own problems, right, and their own limitations, right? Um, they did come together well, right, um, the, the strengths of, of different party leaders, and we can talk more about that if, if people are interested. But I think what is crucial here is that the party developed a set of practices. It was like a cultural technology. It was a, it was a cultural technology that had the capacity to really challenge authority from below, to disrupt, right? To challenge containment policing, to make it impossible for police to continue treating people the way that they were treating people, and at the same time, to do so in such a way that when that heavy repression came, that repression was threatening much more broadly, and people would, would really support them. So I think those two elements are key, that we, we need to think about the practices. We take them for granted, right? We think, okay, we know what movements look like. We can go and we can march and we can go and we can sit in. Well, you can't sit in against poverty and you can't sit in against police brutality. You couldn't in 1966 and you can't today. It didn't work in the early 60s, it doesn't work now. How do you fight you know, Trump's rise of authoritarianism? How do you make business as usual impossible for the Trump administration in a way that is really hard to repress? I don't think the answer to that question is obvious. And I think that that's really becomes the crux of it. That, you know, there's some part of chance, right? There were real strengths to the individuals and leaders involved. But I don't know, does anybody know anyone who was really famous and influential when they were younger and now are in a very different sort of stage of history and part of their life? and maybe aren't like quite as influential in everything that they touch after that moment, right? There's something that happens where, where the, the, the activities, the practices themselves become powerful, right? And that, that culture of technology is developed. And we need, to, we need to use that as a way of sharpening our question. If we want to resist Trump, if we want to resist the rise of fascist authoritarianism, of, of racism today, you know, we need to be able to look at what kind of practices work to do that well. What kind of practices make business as usual impossible in a way that's difficult to repress. Okay, we're gonna open it up in a, in a couple of minutes. I have a, another question. I have a lot of questions, but we'll just do this one. Um, Eldridge Cleaver, in his role of having these connections to these predominantly white, left-leaning groups, let's talk a little bit about that and juxtapose it with the ideological na uh, differences and similarities in the navigation the Panthers had with SNCC, which you, you know sh has some very key roles. There's a Black Panther Party with SNCC before the Panthers. 
There's a Northern Black uh, uh, Panther Party up here. Uh, they're moving into a militant organization, the merging. There's, there's, there's a fascinating story onto itself, uh, which I think ultimately plays out, you know, coalition building or having a very black nationalistic stance on your politic, um, which I think plays out in debates today in many ways. But let's talk about that and then the role that Eldridge plays because he, he brings in the possibility of having these broad coalitions of what you know eventually gets, as you call in your book, the new left. Let, let me just sort of try to be brief about Eldridge. Um, complicated brother. Um, Very. Brilliant, but complicated. And I do think that the way you represent it um, is sort of one of the important ways that he functions within the party. Um, he has certain networks. He has certain um, sort of resources at his disposal, especially after Soul on Ice. And he himself uh, is very much enamored of what he sees in the party. But it's also clear that he's a person with his a lot of his own ideas about things. He has a, has, has a very strong ego. And so it's not surprising that over time there, there, there would probably, uh, and there, there were clashes. Um, but the other thing, and, 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 and I'd like, I mean, Josh can really give you the nuts and bolts on this, why the party of Huey and Bobby comes to dominate is a fascinating story in and of itself because there was no, there were all these organizations in the Bay Area, some of them competing, some people moving across these, and there was no way, if you were looking on the ground, to know that this was the organization that would one day be the dominant organization. It wasn't clear at all. And I think what, what, what really sets them apart in a lot of ways is the power of the leadership. Huey and Bobby coming together to do what they did and then sort of other people mixing in um, is, is a, for me, sort of a fascinating uh, uh, check. check. The, the, the way that historians like to talk about this is to think about um, sort of the specific conditions that, that created this and why and how that particular organization emerges, and, and, and we try to do some, something like that. The other thing about the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee is that by, by the black power phase, it was a very different kind of organization. It had really um, shifted from a, a, a really interracial politics in a lot of ways to a black power politics, and there were people who are contesting for a different kind of leadership, i.e. John Lewis, when John sees that this, that Stokely and H. Rapp are the future of that party, you know, John Lewis goes off into Democratic Party politics, which is, you know, where he still is today, but there was another group, and then that group is also, you know, talking to and interacting with Huey and Bobby. So it's that kind of environment, but it was, there was no guarantee. There was no, I don't think anybody sort of looked at Huey and Bobby and said, oh, this is the shape of the future. Uh, there was no way to, I mean, the shape of the future looked like someone like Stokely, because Stokely was, as someone said, star child. Uh, he really had, you know, all the charisma. He had a lot of stuff going for him. Um, but I don't think he had the, uh, and, and we can talk about that, why, why, why his, what happens, um, you know, because I think a lot of people would Well, you all said in the book he didn't have the plan, no, and the, the way that the I Panthers, that they were very, have, I mean, you appreciate the, Huey's uh, um, being able to have this theory, and you can appreciate Bobby being able to organize and execute it, and it becomes this powerful thing, as you described in the book. And, you know, I mean, I guess it's a debate as to whether or not SNCC had full plans, but it, I, from what I gather, we're talking about new terrain, the north, and we're talking about the west coast, which yeah. in many ways is similar to the northern environment versus the south, where they were really dominant, where SNCC was really dominant. 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I think so you can look at the leader, you know, you can look at if you want to take those three, you know, Bobby and, and Huey and Eldridge, right? They each brought different things, right? There were important pieces they each brought. Um, so, you know, Bobby was, as you say, an incredible organizer. And he, he was a stand-up comic, right? So he was a great speaker, a great public speaker. Um, Eldridge, um, you know, was also a very flamboyant but very powerful public speaker um, and an amazing writer. And he brought all these networks with, you know, these publishing circles and the white new left, and he really did bring those networks in um, to the party. Um, Huey, he couldn't really publicly speak. Have, have people seen videos of him talking? I mean, he could, he, but he was, he was very philosophical, and he talked in this uh, kind of high-pitched voice, and he went on, and he just, people were like, you know, what are you talking about? <laughs> um, <laughs> And um, so he was not a public speaker, but he had these two. He had these two other elements, right? I mean, one is is that he was really involved in developing these theories and the and the position, and he was also um, very much um, he the one. Who, he was a street guy. So he he was the one who who would make these confrontations, okay. right? And could read the dynamics and make that you know and, and play them out and back the cop down back the cops down with the, the law on a gun and not get shot or arrested, right? Um, so, so there were these important sort of characteristics of the personality. I, I tend to look at that as fairly contingent, right? And we're just talking about sort of the big, you know, main three originators here. I mean, there's so many women, there's so many men that we could talk about that all brought really important pieces um, to the party. And I, I really do believe, right, that, that it's that it is the practice, not just the plan, right? You look at SNCC and Stokely Carmichael and H. Rap yeah. Brown and Jim Foreman and all these folks who were so effective, right? SNCC led the vast majority of the, of, the, of the civil disobedience and the civil rights movement. These are the folks that dismantled Jim Crow. But when it came to the late 60s, when it came to fighting police brutality, when it came to you know, challenging poverty and political exclusion, they didn't know what to do. You know, it wasn't their character, right? I mean, it's the same, same people. Right, it's the same folks, but they couldn't. They didn't have the. They didn't have the practices, and I think that there's some contingency to it. I think that there were a lot of people trying different things. That what the Panthers did in Oakland was not unique. We just talked about some of the different strands they drew on. They put it together in a particular way that worked. Right, and I think that that really that's really what drove the ascendance of the Black Panther Party. Well, we know that SNCC is the reason why Dr. King took his position on Vietnam. You know, that's because right. SNCC had that that element. Um, as we take questions, I guess what I would toss out there, you know, what's overarching in all this um, effectiveness or lack of effect uh, of effectiveness, we can't discount the role of the state in COINTELPRO. And I would, I would imagine that SNCC was already a target well before the Panthers and things were going to get undermined and splits were going to be fostered and, and, um, and, and, and things were going to move in a certain direction. And then you have this other organization that pops up out of Oakland and then they got to take some time to, you know, craft splits and do whatever. And, you know, we're following that. Um, and then you just have the outright brutality where people are just killed, you know, at the end of the day, like we're going to take Fred Hampton out and take this person out, we're gonna take this person out, and everybody else is going to jail. Um, and we're at that moment now, and I don't think there are full appreciations, I know you all talked about it, but I don't think we really internalized like the, what the state has, the role it's played. And you see that primarily when you see certain types of engagement with the state while people will also extol the virtues of the Panthers, and you'd be like, well, the Panthers wouldn't have really you know, embrace the state that maybe some organizations are today, and that may be a debate in, in itself. So with that being said, why don't we um, get some questions and comments and what have you, and uh, sis over there, will, Naomi, will be Oprah. Hi. Your, your book seems to me to um, stress the relation of, the, of draft resistance and the whole anti-war movement and the initial sort of coalition with the Panthers. But the Panthers began to unravel before the draft ended, and while the, it seems to me the anti-war movement was still rising into 1970 with the great uh, student strike, is it is it uh, possible that you have, your timing is timing is off for the whole uh, anti-war Panther 
connection. Okay, let's just hold that question. Let's keep that in mind, and let's get another one as well, so they can do both at, you know, we'll do two at once. So we got the draft question, and the Panthers uh, maybe unraveling as the draft movement is going up. And what's your comment? Oh, Ricky, Hi. Vincent, yeah, I the author guess. of Party Music, that's uh, in the building, which talks about the Black Panthers and okay. the band yeah. The Lumpin. Uh, thanks. Uh, now, you guys both, you referred to Eldridge and you referred to Stokely, and you sort of unpacked something that I hadn't really thought about, and that is how, yes, they're charismatic, they're, they're leaders, but Stokely was really going in a black nationalist direction, and that may have hindered some of the, the daily practices that Josh, you were talking about. They couldn't really organize that way because they didn't want whites involved, but Eldridge for all his craziness, he and Kathleen, we need to make sure people know yeah. Kathleen mm -hmm. and Elders did a lot of that networking with That's the right. other organizations. Uh, Elders and Kathleen, they had a way of crossing over into the white left, navigating them and playing them because the white left wanted credibility and the Panthers needed bodies to, to support. And so there's really something between Stokely's nationalist direction of leadership and Eldridge's sort of, uh, I, I don't know what you call, inclusive radicalism when they were trying to really ex you know, explode the party, use the free Huey thing that, to make it go. And um, I didn't really thought much about it, but can you really dig into how Eldridge played the anti-war movement and all the other uh, characters that were involved? Uh, I think the Panthers are known for their coalition building, um, but there was something unique and crazy about the way Elders made it happen. So let's get those two. He started, they're kind of related in some ways. They're talking about the draft resistance and... I'll go first, because I yeah. think th there, there's a piece of this that I also want to pick up on. I, I think you're totally right about Stokely. Stokely was going in a more pan-Africanist, black separatist sort of direction, which really was going in another direction. But um, the, the, the other piece um, that I think is, is very, very important, especially in terms of thinking about um, sort of um, what, what, what you're talking about with Eldridge and Kathleen is a larger political dynamic. And to me, uh, I'd frame it something like this. Um, can you listen to, hear, and follow black leadership. Why do I put it this way? Because the history of interracial politics is very fraught, and one of the reasons I think it's fraught is because white people want to bring supremacy and dominance into the relationship. And so one of the things you have, all these organizations, abolitionism, women's rights, everybody struggles with this. Um, when you have people, like black people, can you listen to them? Can you hear them? And can you follow them? And it strikes me that our history around that is deeply troubled. And it strikes me that one of the geniuses that, that uh, Eldridge and Kathleen had was they understood how you, you need to manipulate certain kinds of networks to get what you want. Now, I, I also know that from the other side, there are lots of you know, white radicals and everybody who sort of had their own needs and concerns and people opposed to this. So it's, you know, it's, it, it, it's complicated. But for me, as an African American, African American is thinking about it historically, one of the things that stands out to me is who, who listens to, who hears, and who can actually work with black people without trying to run it without trying to tell them what to do, who to be, how to dress. You know, I think this is, you know, can we, can I be me? Uh, and, and can we work with me being me, as opposed to you telling me how to be me? Um, I think that whole problem, and I think Eldridge and Kathleen totally finessed that. Well, that's, that I think is a, a good point about the book because you get that nuts and bolts understanding of what was going on. Because again, when we talk about it today, it's talked about in this kumbaya sense, you know, where everybody, thought, and we forget there was struggle, there was, there was intelligence, 
There was, as Ricky might have described, an understanding of how you might have to flip and pimp and play somebody to get from point A to point B because there was an unwillingness to sit back and listen. And there's a certain type of genius in that uh, because, again, we're talking about, we're not talking about 30 and 40 year olds. We're talking about 19 and 20 and 21 year olds, which, which I come back. These are students that have to figure this all out, you know, in the middle of this deep, um, horrific oppression that is not letting up and giving you no avenues to to escape. You know, you, you have no friends, you know, in these high places. And so I think that's what I, I really appreciate. Um, so he, he had a question about, about, the, about the, about the draft. The Vietnam yeah. War. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know if people understand this. Um, has anybody seen, did anybody see that movie that came out a bunch of years back, Ali with Will Smith? Mm -hmm. Do people see that? When I saw that, my initial reaction, and I hadn't looked into this at the time, I was like, you're kidding me, right? So you have Ali there, and he's like front and center out by himself, basically, resisting the draft. And there's no big anti-war movement. There's no big draft resistance. He's just like this hero out there by himself. I'm like, come on, Hollywood, right? And then I went and looked into it, and it's dead on. Right? There had been a few small Catholic organizations doing draft resistance, and they were like treated as traitors and beaten in the street. Um, and SNCC really started following after Ali. You know, they started to really champion the draft resistance. And SDS was the biggest student organization. They were doing some anti-war organizing on campus. They hadn't completely blown up yet, but they were, they were pretty big and national. And um, in 66, they invited Stokely out um, to talk about black power. And this is right when black power sort of becomes this. This is at Berkeley. This is, this is right in Berkeley. In Berkeley. In Berkeley um, to the university. It's the, it's the Berkeley, um, it's the National Convention of Students for Democratic Society, but it's being held at Berkeley in, in 1966, October. And this is just before the founding of the party. And Stokely's been talking about Black Panther and all this from Lowndes County. And they call him out. And he gets on stage and he says, you all are talking to yourself. He says, if I'm going to kill, I'm going to decide who I'm going to kill. If you want to make this movement real, you have to start resisting the draft. And you, we, we, we went through, and I've, you know, we found all these flyers, and we looked, and there had been no draft resistance in SDS, no draft resistance in the Berkeley area, right? And right after that, all the flyers are like, we asked Stokely to come and talk to us, and he said, so let's talk about draft resistance. And then the draft resistance starts, and the resistance organization, right, so SNCC very directly very directly pushes, um, and, and, and the Black Panther Party steps into that role, right? Because it's the, and so there's this, there's this Emery spoke here last week <clears throat> in this auditorium, and he did this drawing, and it's this three-part analogy, um, and um, the Panthers had it in their paper, and then it was taken up widely by, by the new left and the, and the anti-war movement, and it was three pigs, each stomping on somebody's head, and one was the police stomping on black people. The next one was the National Guard stomping on war resistors. And the last one was the Marines stomping on the Vietnamese. So this idea that this is an anti-imperialist struggle, and our struggle as black people from the Black Panther Party is part and parcel of this global struggle against imperialism. That was taken up widely, you know, and the, and the party was a reference because it made the imperialist struggle real, it made it local, it brought it home, right? So the party, you know, was involved heavily in the early um, Stop the Draft Week in 1967 here in the Bay, and in 69, SDS declared the Black Panther Party vanguard of our common struggle against imperialism, right? So the party was very involved um, as a you know, reference and in the gestation of, um, of the anti-war draft resistance. Okay. And the black freedom struggle more generally um, was really foundational to that turn. Let's get a couple more. Go ahead. Yeah, um, thanks for your great book. Um, last year at the, in Oakland at the 50th year, 50th anniversary of the Panther Party, um, I asked Kathleen Kleber <clears throat> what she, how would she compare the uh, Black Panthers with the, the uh, Black Lives Matter movement. Her, an her answer basically was that <clears throat> we were the Black Panther Party for self-defense. We were not nonviolent. Also, my question is, <clears throat> Richard Aoki, <clears throat> uh, he was a close associate of uh, Bobby Seale and Huey, 
And uh, <clears throat> when the FBI came out and charged him, I mean, uh, outed him out as a spy for the for them, Bobby Seale said it was a bogus charge. What is your take? Okay. We'll hold that, <sighs> okay. and we'll okay. get another one. Well, thanks for coming. I'm really enjoying the conversation. Um, Josh has emphasized the importance of practice, and, and Waldo has emphasized the, the role of women and, again, elements of practice in the community. And when I think of a revolutionary movement, I also think of inspiration and vision of possibility. And, you know, one of my email addresses has got a... Uh, uh, the the tenth point of the Black Panther Party ten point program, which I just want to read, which is oh shoot, <laughs> um, sorry, I had it up here and it closed on me. Um, You're not going to read all ten, right? No, no, just oh. just just the, <laughs> just the tenth, right? <laughs> he said the tenth point is we want land, bread, housing, education, clothing, justice peace, and people's community control of modern technology. Now that sounds like a revolutionary vision to me that maybe inspired people to not only resist, I like to say as, a, as an activist myself, resistance is not enough. What we need is a good strategy. And these guys were an articulating a strategy that was based in the practice of feeding people and organizing people to do for themselves, that's a huge threat to the power structure, in my view. I wonder if you had any comments on how that, where that came from and how that, in practice, worked out. So we had his question in the back. He mentioned Black Lives Matter and Richard Aoki uh, being outed as a spy, Bobby Seale saying it's bogus, and we have this 10-point uh, platform thing. So um, I'll say just a brief couple words about each, and maybe Waldo will um, have some other things to say. Um, so um, violence and, and Black Lives Matter. I mean, I think this is the point about practice, right, is that um, you can't apply the same practice to a different political situation and expect it to work effectively. I think that for an organization to do what the Black Panther Party did today in a very different historical and political situation, you know, they would be, you know, labeled as terrorists and, you know, kill with impunity. I think um, that is not a politics that's gonna work today, right? So it's a different moment and different, and different practices are required. Um, I think in terms of Richard Aoki, it's not something that I claim to be an expert on. There's been a lot of people who have said different things. People have said, yeah, the FBI wanted to sort of discredit that there were a lot of Asian Americans who were paying attention to the party, and there's been a bunch of books coming out. And so this was, you know, something that the FBI was doing to basically, you know, snitch Jack at Aoki. I don't have any evidence that that's true. Um, I think that what some of the interpretations that make the most sense to me um, are um, some of the Asian American historians that have talked about the way that, you know, when I, Aoki in these documents initially worked for um, the FBI when he was very young and it was in the context of the Korean War, I believe, um, it, it was um, a very different kind of situation. And so what um, some people think is that his sort of interests evolved, and he basically was stuck in the middle and didn't really have a way out. Um, it's really hard to know what happened with Aoki, but um, uh, there were a lot of people who were infiltrating at very high levels um, and were... Um, yeah, were I think the that. FBI wouldn't be limited to Richard Aoki in terms of just having a spy when you just look at the papers themselves. They were you going all let out. Me, let me give an example of that, right? William O'Neill was he was the he was the security officer for Fred Hampton, right? And he would publish articles in the Black Panther paper on the payroll of the FBI that said, if you get a, somebody who you think is an informant, torture them. 
right? I mean, this is what the FBI was paying people to write in the Black Panther Party. And then he's the one who gave the map of the house and showed where Fred Hampton was going to be sleeping and drugged him and these kinds of things. Um, So there were a lot of high level informants. And, you know, we don't know exactly what happened. I think Richard Aoki was around for long enough and did enough, you know, positive things that I think it may be a complex story. Um, I want to say about vision. Yeah, absolutely. The, the Black Panther Party had a very strong vision. I think what the point about practice is not that it's like tactics instead of, instead of vision. When I say practice, vision is part of that. How do you, how do you explain and think about what it is that, you, that you're doing? But the point is to distinguish practice also from just philosophy. Right, so we look at the revolutionary action movement and RAM, and, and a lot of the philosophical statements were the same. Uh, much of the ten point program was taken from Malcolm X, but the ideas and the vision themselves did not a movement make. People had to do stuff, and they had to do stuff that was effective and powerful. And the and the party developed those practices. Just one thing, um, you know, in the book you show that there was the ten point platform, but there was what we want, and then there was ten things of what we need, which I think is important for people to see. There's twenty things. Altogether, the other thing um, you you keep mentioning Malcolm for the ten point platform with the Nation of Islam, but what I didn't see um, what was the dance, what was the navi- what was what was the interaction with the Nation of Islam, which you know was one of those first militant groups that was that was an inspiration definitely for a lot of people in the cities, especially when you go on the eastern coast. Um, you know, was it just limited to Malcolm? Were there conversations as everything was going on um, with the nation or Elijah or various chapters? How, how did that play out with the Panthers from the research y'all did? Me, really? Go ahead. No, I, I think that the, the um, my, my reading of this and uh, has a lot to do with the extraordinary impact of Malcolm. Um, I think um, Malcolm's evolution toward the end of his life and the politics that he himself was crafting for the kind of organization that he wanted to lead, I think was more of an inspiration. Um, And I don't, this is not to discount the nation of Islam, but I do think that Malcolm, um, you, I, I just think that Malcolm's impact is outsized. I, I think he is, in a lot of ways, what a lot of people think about when they think about the nation, which is sort of not true, obviously. So, I mean, I, I see a lot of it is, I see, uh, in a lot of ways, the party as the children of Malcolm. Right. That's and I see it, I, to me, yeah. it's more, you know, coming out of Malcolm. It, because, as you know, the, the nation is a very complicated, socially conservative organization doing all kinds of things. And I don't think a lot of that is, you know, sort of where, where the Panthers were coming from. Let me just say one thing about Richard A. Oakey. Um, I knew him personally. I met him uh, socially uh, in a context where he was the only Asian American person there. Everybody else was black. And so my immediate response was, who is he? Um, but I liked him. Um, and I didn't know who he was. Uh, and when I started understanding who he was, it was very clear to me that he was a very complicated, and that's my favorite word, um, <laughs> guy. And I know a lot of people who knew him. Uh, I've read a lot of stuff about this. And I don't know if we'll ever know the total truth, but one of the things that I think is that he was never a policy insider. I mean, I don't think he was running things. My sense of him, judging from what I know, he ran guns. Uh, you know, he knew how to get guns. He knew he knew <laughs> he had logistical training. He knew how to use guns. He knew how to get. He knew how to get guns. Um, and he had grown up, you know, with 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 with, with a lot of the you know, early Panthers. So there, there was this personal connection. The other thing is that there was a whole radical revolutionary Asian American left that he's a part of. And so trying to think about the relationship between that and the kind of politics that, you know, sort of connects through some kind of third world nexus, what he's doing over there with what, you know, he's doing, uh, you know, because he's sort of new, new, new Bobby and, and, and everybody else is, is, is another kind of question. Um, third world strike at Berkeley, creating ethnic studies. There's Richard Aoki, uh, third world activism, creating, you know, in, in early San Francisco, there's Richard Aoki. He's, you know, he's, he's involved 
<laughs> and a lot of different things, including some of this. But my basic take on him, and, and there's a whole issue of the Amerasia Journal committed, you know, everybody weighs in on this. I don't really, I mean, I'm sure what I get is that he, he was not an, a, you know, he, he was not an inside guy. You know, they, they, he ran guns, he did this, he right. did that, but he was not, he was not up there discussing policy or theory with Huey, or he was not sort of crafting sort of, you know, these other kinds of plans with Bobby. That's sort of my sense of it, but I agree with Josh. We really don't know uh, because there's a lot of stuff. Uh, people are trying to figure this out. The other thing is that he is an iconic presence. I think this is the other thing. I, I go to certain communities and speak to certain bodies of, uh, uh, of students. Richard Aoki is like huge. And I think we really need to grapple with that too. You know, it's, it's, it's sort of has this sort of rep and people are trying to figure out what the meaning of this right. you know, thing is, you know, I don't, yeah. Hello, I'm Lizbeth. Um, my question is, there's two different changes from that time. One is the iPhone or the phone with the video that's in all of our hands, and the second is that we have social media to get a lot more light shined on you know, inequities and such. So what ideas do you have around how we could be advancing and taking action with our video and showing more truth around what's occurring around us and micro inequities and brutality? Thoughts? Technology question in organizing. Let's get another one. Hi. We go, um, come to you next. I, I kind of uh, piggyback on this question. Um, I, I just wanted to tell you, you both, I, I'm just so appreciative of how you have just deconstructed the movement in just two just very profound ways. One um, that made the book just a read that you wouldn't want to put down, but at the same time, just my heart was just like, you know, tearing apart. One by, you know, Mr. Bloom, you talk about your cultural technology, which is like so important, the practices. And then Mr. Martin just breaking down the amount of state violence and oppression and tying that to the movement itself and how powerful it was at the time, which, you know, kind of begs that question of, gosh, you know, then how do you maintain the movement? And today our movements, the, the young folks movement, has to be so different because of the media and because we have this history of such aggressive oppression by the state, that it has to be underground uh, to a certain extent, which is both a burden and a blessing. And I wonder if either of you have any comments on that. Thank you. Naomi. I, I think, I, oh, no, no, that's not, isn't that the second question? No, no, go yeah. ahead. You can hit those questions. I just oh, okay. to make sure to brother here um, gets I just want to sort of respond to something. Um, the older I get, and I'm 67, the clearer it is to me, um, each generation must make its own history. And what I think is very, very important is for those of us who may know a little something to try to help them along. But what I really resist is old people trying to tell people who are going to do it, what to do. If you want me, I tell you, I'll share with you whatever I may think. But I think each generation must make its own history. And, and one of the things I feel very sad about today is that I don't think my generation in some ways did as good a job as I thought we would do. Um, when I was in my teens and 20s, I just knew, you know, 50, 40 years from now, you know, oh, we'll be there. Not quite. Uh, and I really am sometimes depressed about that because I figure, well, maybe I shouldn't have done that. I should, maybe I should have, you know, and, and you know, what, what, what might, but I think ultimately, um, you know, giving young people whatever they need 
whatever tools, whatever resources, whatever material they need to, to, to do what they need to do. The other thing, and I think Josh and, and someone said this, to, to, you have to dream change. You have to, you have to imagine it. You have to create it. Because if you don't create it and imagine it and dream it, where is it going to come from? It's certainly not in some book. Like you say, we don't have any guy. So you have to dream a revolution. You have to dream change. You have to imagine it. I think that's the other thing. We need to empower young people to imagine a, a different world, to, to, to dream a different world. And right now, one of the things I find with my students is that most of them are not into, they like change, but they don't want to upset the apple cart, which you can't have. And they aren't very interested in, they think capitalism is one. They think that we've reached the end of history, sort of, you know, because this is going to be capitalist and that's just going to be it. Um, and so m my argument with them is that, how do you know this? You know, um, you know are you God? Um, you know, the people who invented the current economic system and, and, and as it developed didn't necessarily. And so my thing is that if you, if you think you want equality of some kind, if you want democracy of a, what kind, what is equality? What is democracy? How is it, you know? And so what, what I find is people don't even want to talk about economic equality because it's going to rock their boat. But, you know, somebody's boat's going to get rocked. And I think we, you know, my, my sense is that I, I really, you know, old folks, we need to help young folks do what they got to do. And then we have to give them the space to dream and imagine possible that. worlds. I, I agree, my brother. <laughs> I agree, but I, what, what, what I don't, sometimes I feel some of my colleagues in my cohort want to close it down. You know, uh, they don't want to let young people be young people. But, Make mistakes, do you know, what they got to do, say what they got to say. But you know what? One of the things that I also gathered from the book, and then we'll come to, what's, brother, what's your name again? Uh, Panther in the front? Dennis, hello. De Dennis, okay, yeah. Uh, we're going to come to you in a, in a second. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so that's why I want to make sure. I saw you wave yours. Uh, in the book, what I gather is that what we celebrate now wasn't widely known then. And so you could have been in another part of the country and not know that there was people patrolling the police, wouldn't have known that they were the free breakfast program, et cetera. And I bring this up because we just did a talk um, at Merit a couple of weeks ago, and we made this point. I had somebody that was there, and they were talking about, somebody's like, what are these young people doing? And, you know, it's like, well, there's 45 uh books and breakfast programs right around, coming out of the Ferguson Rebellion, right? People didn't know that. Uh, many of those people been to the UN, not once, not twice, but four different times, and got responses. So the challenge before the people in that room is like, where were you getting your information from? Because many people, I didn't see it on CNN, well, why the hell are you watching CNN to get your information when your politic in the 60s was not to trust the media that would distort you? Right, and so I want to caution us to also know that, you know, I teach at SF State, and a lot of students are doing things that you would not believe, that are, do, you know, they're struggling, uh, they they are learning from elders, they're talking to a lot of these Panthers, that are Erica Huggins or an Elaine, a lot of them are sitting up there soaking up game. We're not going to always see their moves. It doesn't mean that it's not underground. It's just that KTVU is not here today talking about what you all are talking about. Quran ain't here, but let there be a fight outside, and, every, and that'd be the first story. And even if it is covered, it doesn't have the complexity and the nuances that really require you to get a full breadth of what we're talking about. And so I just want to say from my standpoint, I see a lot of folks doing a lot of things, but they also got a lot of challenges in front of them. Um, but it's going to be up to us to really dig deep the way that you all dug deep 
to bring these stories out so now we can celebrate them, but I don't think people have just stopped and called it a day and clicked in. There's a lot of people, but even back in, the, in those days, from what I understand, there's a lot of people that weren't down with work, marching with Martin. There wasn't a lot of people down with the Panthers. 50 years later, everybody marched with Martin, and everybody was part of the Panthers, <laughs> right? And I'm old enough to know, you know, and I know Ricky, Ricky in the back, we're old enough to know that there was a lot of people that weren't down with the anti-apartheid movement at Berkeley. Now you sit up here today, not only does UC Berkeley celebrate it, the very institution that opposed it, there's a whole lot of people that were part of that movement that you're just like, wow. You know, then you gotta go, how old are you? So you're 30, that meant you were a part of it when you were two. You see what I mean? You gotta go through those type of things. So I just want us to kind of put that in mind and I think your book brought out a lot of that. So t can we get Dennis's question since he is a panther? And then we'll, yeah, and we'll get the, okay. Okay. Okay, go ahead. Uh, okay, um, uh, what I want to say is, um, from what I'm getting, from what you guys are saying, um, we had a lot of powerful leaders with, uh, you know, the Huey Newton, um, Bobby Seale, and uh, Eldridge Cleaver, and whatnot, and, and Kathleen Cleaver. And um, the question I'm, you know, that's kind of getting to me in a way is uh, us kind of going in. And, uh, you know, we're not gonna, always going to agree on things, but just how we seem to be getting sprayed off in different directions. And like you mentioned William O'Neill, how the infiltration affected us. us. And what I'm, what I'm getting at is how did that play a factor in ultimately breaking down the movement? And as we move forward, how important it is for us to maybe not be exactly on the same page, but how when you go off in different directions, you got all these strong personalities, how ineffective that is in the long run and how, it, you know, how it'll end up working against us. Because that seems to be a problem, be, even been going back to slavery with the field, the field Negro and the house Negro. And how that just tears us down in the long run. So we got a question on division and how that works systemically. Thank you for letting me be here today. Um, I was with the 504 movement in 1977, where you have ramps and braille things and uh, better education for young kids and blind kids and disabled kids all over the world now. I became a member in that building, the federal building in which we took over in 1977, and I think it was April 14th, the newspaper said, so you can look at it. And it's been almost 70, oh, 47 years or something like that. My question is twofold. Number one, there is a way that we can conquer a lot of this stuff and a lot of the things that the government is going to try to stop us to do. First thing is to learn how to use our mind. The imagination is a very important tool that we must learn how to use and can learn how to use and specific avenues to learn how to use to move past all of this. Second thing, there are two books you must read. One book is How to Clear Yourself from Legal Tyranny. The other book is Infinite Banking. Those are other books uh, that you can read. They're not in the revolutionary sense, but I think they can open many, many doors to help us move in that direction. I want to thank the two gentlemen uh, that wrote the book. I really enjoyed it, especially all of the the word, visual words that made me believe that I was there, and yes, I grew up in San Francisco, and it was a part of that every day of my life, so I totally understand what the media and everybody else was doing, and yes, it was just nothing but barrage of what the state was doing. But if you learn how to conquer your imagination and your mind, the state will not be able to touch you. All right, thank you. Thanks for that, Dennis. <laughs> Wanna get the last two? Okay. I want to field this question from the youth. Okay. My name is Garen. I'm happy what the Black Panthers did. Because I would be here. Thank you for that. 
and I bet you when, when he goes home, he'll talk a mile a minute like my kids, and then you put a mic in front of them, they're just like. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right on, though. I appreciate it. Um, are we... I want to say um, I want to say a couple of things about the divisions in the party and um, the unraveling of the party. Um, I mean, there were differences from the start. Um, there were big egos involved. Um, there were some ideological differences. Part of what the party did is it created a politics that contained a tremendous amount of tension, right? So you have all the, the sort of violence that, that we've been talking about that black people experience just as part of daily life. And then you have this party that's standing up to that and it's facing a tremendous amount of repressive action. And so, you know, it's really living in a war. I mean, the, the people who dedicated their lives to this revolution were really living in a war. And, and the way that, the way that, that I tried to um, make sense of the history, when you look at sort of, Let's break down the way that the unraveling and the split actually happens. Um, for people who haven't read the book fully, the, the party um, really is, is at the front and center of black liberation struggle for about three years or so. And in um, early 1971, there's a major split in the party. And it um, very quickly, um, most of the national chapters are shut down and it returns to being a local Oakland organization again. Um, and the split is in part um, a personality thing, right? And there's tensions between, um, in specific, sort of Cleaver on the one hand and Huey um, and um, David Hilliard on the other are sort of main characters in this. Maybe Geronimo and the um, New York 21 are with, with Cleaver in the international section as, as big players in this. Um, but there's also an ideological component. Um, so um, what happens is that the national headquarters um, really turns and starts talking basically about social democracy and says, we're going to put down the gun. We're going to put down self-defense politics. We're going to really focus on the community programs and um, what they call survival pending revolution. And the international group and the New York 21 and you know say, Basically, we're going to fight it out and have guerrilla warfare. And what happens is that neither of those politics are very tenable. Um, the, 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 both the Cleaver faction, the BLA, I mean, most of the people who try to wage guerrilla warfare end up very quickly um, either dead or in exile or in prison. And that branch of the party is, is um, really crushed um, very, very rapidly and, and forcefully. Um, what happens to the Oakland party and the national headquarters and the folks that say survival pending revolution is that it becomes another community organization. It becomes, you know, one of a thousand different organizations trying to, you know, have some community support. And so there was, a, there was an intense tension and ambiguity contained in the practice of the party, right? In being able to say, we're going to have this armed self-defense and we're really going to do it in a way that we can at least, as a national organization, be above ground and legal and sustain this and do the community support, but we're going to stand up to the, to the police and we're going to deny the sovereign rights. So what, in reading it, there are some tensions, and one of the questions alluded to this earlier, Part of what happens is the repression, but I, I think, and we argue this very pointedly in the book, repression is not enough to explain what happens to the party. Repression is not enough. And so there's two, there's, let me give you three reasons why, I, uh, three pieces of evidence about why repression is not enough to explain what happens. The first is, let's look at the timing. The most intense repression of the party is in 1969 over the course of 1969 and into 1970. And those are the two years that the party grows the most. The more forceful and direct the repression, the raids, the killings, the arrests, all of it, that's when the party grows. That's the period of the party's greatest growth. The second piece of evidence is that if you look, and we only deal with this cursorily in the book, but there's a pretty big secondary literature. If you look at other organizations that had a similar politics, 
And there were a number of them. Think of Drum, think of um, Republic of New Africa has some similarities. There is a range of other revolutionary um, nationalist uh, organizations that have some influence, not as much as the party, but in that same period. All of them, all of them decline at the same time. All of them decline at the same time. So what, what we argue is that the context shifts in important ways. And what really um, makes the repression stick and what makes these divisions in the party um, uncontainable and what drives this wedge and, and forces the party to separate and to, to desert these two kinds of, um, the combination of these kinds of revolutionary claims in armed politics with commute programs is actually concessions. It's actually concessions. It's, now, now, it's very different than the civil rights movement. In the civil rights movement, the concessions are made directly to the movement, right? You think about the sit-ins, and the way that the, the civil rights movement, think about the sit-ins. You know, February 1st, 1960, Greensboro, North Carolina, four college students sit down, and they violate Jim Crow lunch counter, right? And they're not they're not brutalized, they're not arrested. People all over the South look at that and they say, wait a minute, they had to shut down that Woolworth to deal with those students? Now we have a practice we can use. And it's like wildfire. Within three months, virtually, well, every state in the South, except for Mississippi and virtually all the large cities, have, have these kinds of mobilizations, right? So what happens is that in the civil rights movement, the public spaces are integrated, right? In the civil rights movement, voting, voting rights are, are institutionalized, right? In the civil rights movement, there's for, formal desegregation, right? In the, in the case of the Black Panther Party, it's not like the federal government gets up and says, okay, you can have community sovereignty, we're not gonna govern you anymore, right? <laughs> Uh, but what, what happens is that the, the level of disruption, and, and it's not just the party, right? You have to think about the anti-war movement and the draft resistance. You have to think about the women's movement. You have to think about the environmental movement. You have to think about this vast mobilization that's destabilizing the kinds of um, oppressive organization that's structured into American society. And what happens is that, ironically, it's Nixon who at the same time is coming so hard at the left makes concessions to the middle. This is under Nixon that you get affirmative action. It's under Nixon that you get municipal hiring of black people. It's under Nixon that you get an increase in a growth of black electoral representation. It's under Nixon that you roll back and repeal and eventually end the war and the draft, right? And so what happens is that those concessions they intensify the effects and the pressure from the repression, right? Because remember, the party is able to survive and sustain in, in the face of this intense repression because the allies are turning out. Folks like Whitney Young, right, are mobilizing to say, okay, you can't treat the Panthers like that. But the more that there are institutional avenues, the more that that 80% of Democratic voters who voted to end the war in the draft and were slapped in the face by the Democratic Party, the more the Democratic Party embraces the, the position of the anti-war movement and says, yes, we need to end the war in the draft, now there's an institutional channel, right? And now it's harder to sustain the kind of position that the Panthers have really built their power on, which says, we need sovereignty, we need community self-control, we are gonna govern ourselves, right? It's harder to sustain those kinds of politics. So the, the context changed. Now, does that mean that necessarily the Black Panther Party would not have undergone those fissions in the face of the repression and there wouldn't have been splits between Cleaver and Huey and everything else? I have no crystal ball, I can't answer that question. But what I can tell you is, is that I believe that if those concessions had not been made, if we had a draft today like we had in 1966, 1967, 1968, 1969, 1970, by 1970 it was starting to roll back and then it, it rolled back very quickly. If we had the la if, if the police department in San Francisco and Oakland and Chicago and New York and Newark and everywhere else was still 100% wider nearly, if there was almost no electoral representation of black people in this country, right? we would still have organizations like the Black Panther Party today. If you had revolutionary movements and governments throughout Africa and Asia, right, and there hadn't been the diplomatic resolution, we would, we would still have politics like the Black Panther Party today. So what's happened is that the political context changed under the party, right, through those concessions to allies, right? And the politics that the party had developed 
no longer were able to wield the same kind of influence. Okay. Uh, the, uh, I need to say something that's germane to uh, my question, which is that I lead a walking tour about real estate and politics, and I'm a bit embarrassed to say that it was featured as a centerfold of this month's November's a San Francisco magazine. The author was quite brave in putting it into a real estate magazine, uh, Lindsay Smith. Uh, my question is, uh, well, my wa an alternative walking uh, title for my walking tour, riffing off of the title of the book, might be People Against Real Estate. And I'm interested, intrigued, I, I've read the book, is there any position that the Panthers had respecting the monopoly, essentially, of, of real estate, by chiefly by white interests and exclusion, therefore, the paying of rent over to uh, the empire? I, I think what you get uh, are a series of specific mobilizations around specific moments, but I don't remember any sort of like policy directive, but being able to control your own community and seeking economic equity within the community. They, they had rhetoric which spoke to this, but, I, but and I know there were specific landlords and stuff that you know came under the purview of some, some actions. Um, but right off the top of my he head, I can't remember anything. That I, I think Josh is... Yeah, right. yeah, so this is point four of the program yeah. and, and platform. Point four, um, what we want, we want decent housing fit for shelter of human beings. Um, what we believe, we believe that if the white landlords will not give decent housing to our black community, then the housing and the land should be made into cooperatives so that our community with government aid can build and make decent housing for its people. So that was the program and the platform, and the party um, engaged in a lot of mobilization around evictions and those kinds of things in various cities. And it's important to read the part about the needs, because we just know the 10 points, but we don't read the needs, which kind of gives it a richer context. So there you have it. Do we, are we wrapping up, or was I, one last question? I understand at um, one point in time that there were more females in the party than there were males. I wanted to know where this imbalance came from, and do you think it came from the fact that, or do you think that, uh, was it the fact that police were more prone to shoot males than females, so more females got into the party? Understand what I'm saying? I mean, and where's Angela Davis? She was Women are always doing the work. I mean, I think, I think in some ways it's not unique to the party, right? A lot of times it's the women who do the work. And, and that was true in a lot of the civil rights movement as well. Um, so even though the party started as a predominantly sort of male-centered organization, there were women right from the start. And some of the women were carrying the guns. Uh, w they weren't. And there, there weren't as many confrontations, but there were, there were, there were instances where that did happen. Um, then you, have people seen that famous poster of um, Huey Newton in the Wicker Throne? In that same photo session, there was a, there was a woman panther. And there are photos of her in the, holding the same sort of garb. She wasn't in the Wicker Throne, but she had the gun, and she w had the spear, and she was um, you know, in that. And, and some of the early, like when the Panthers went to Sacramento, there were women in that delegation, Ruby Dowell among them. I mean, look at Black Lives Matter. You know, it was started by women and is, you know, um, led by Anti-police terror network with Cat Brooks. I mean, I think the thing is, is that historically, as you mentioned, women are the key in a lot of it. Even when we talk about the march, I mean, the boycott in Montgomery. If you don't talk about um, Joanne Robinson, you don't talk about the Women's Political Caucus, then you miss a big part of the, the boat. But having taught that, I'll show the documentary and I'll ask my class, what do you remember about it? And what they remember is King led the boycott in Montgomery. Even though right there on the eye on the prize, they interview the sister right there, right? And so part of what our challenge is is that we're conditioned to invisibilize a whole lot of folks, which is why we were even 
broaching this conversation about black leadership in general because there's an invisibility, an invisibilizing of us as black folks when our genius and our technological proficiencies are all in front and center and instrumental, people just ignore it and just go to another part. And when you trickle that down, women, that happens with women all the time. So uh, there's always been women leadership. I mean, in the book you talk a lot about Kathleen Cleaver and Elaine and the key roles that they play, but America. what ultimately a lot of people will gravitate towards is like, yeah, that's them, and then we'll move that. We're, we're gonna talk about that. If I was just my own personal opinion, in 2017, with so much leadership being held by women in key positions, in key moments, you have this backlash now. So every time you see somebody who is a woman, especially a black woman that's leading, yeah. we have this narrative now that they're, not, they're somehow married to white feminism and that somehow the leadership is now being diluted. I hear that more times than, you know, to, to believe that it's an it's a, it's a, a organic thing. That seems very much planted in my opinion. Like this is a narrative that we want to push because you, you without the women, you're not gonna have the movement. And it's just a way in which I think women network with each other in the way that there's just a get down that just allows things to actually take place at the they end of the, the day. They do the work. They do the work, <laughs> you know, bottom line. <laughs> and, um, and, and, and that becomes a threat. That becomes a threat. And so I think two things are being played out. One is narrative of discounting and discrediting women, which would go right along with what J. Edgar Hoover was talking about. But the other thing is to um, try to find a woman and put her in leadership position where she uh, has a patriarchal type of viewpoint and a whole other manner in which she runs things. So we're gonna find this one woman that will be like, I'm a woman, but I'm doing the same stuff that these males have done, and we ain't even trying to have any sort of gender balance or equality, et cetera, et cetera. But you can point and say we had a woman, just like we can point and say we had a black president, but that black president was all about imperialism like any other president. But that's very hard for a lot of people to swallow. That's true. It's very hard for people to take that, as it would be very hard for a woman who's in leadership position, who they will one day put up there to say that yeah, she was a woman, but she didn't do much different than the other past folks in that position, and that's, that's the challenge. Can we give it up for our two authors? Uh, la <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen. Joshua Bloom and Waldo, Waldo E. Martin. Davey. He stole my thunder, but I just wanted to make a couple of comments. One is that in the wonderful resource uh, guide that I mentioned, uh, there was reference to the 10-point platform. Both the Black Panther pat platform and the Black Lives Matter is there, so it might be interesting in reading for you. Also, the book is available in the back for any of you that are interested. And once again, thank you, Joshua, Waldo, and Davey, for digging deep and leading us in a wonderful conversation. Thank you all.